is 30 seconds of research. Now, the beauty of even doing a little bit of research is that it creates this power of reciprocity, invokes this power of reciprocity. And that, this is again in the science of selling. When I do something nice for someone, it makes them more likely that they're gonna do something nice for me in return. And we see this all the time. And the outcome is focused on quality. And if you focus on that, which which does not really mean that you compromise on the quantity, but if you focus on the quality of that, you know, you will get the outcomes. And those outcomes would be more in relation to what will help you close that deal faster. Someone who can help them. And this is important, not just for salespeople in general, but especially, especially young salespeople, young or newer salespeople who are calling on more senior level decision makers whose job you've never done. Hi guys, welcome to the show today and today I've got a Canadian salesman that you will really enjoy learning from because of the insights that he has. No matter where you are in the world, you and I know that sales is the core at any business or for any entrepreneur. Let me give you his profile, okay? As the founder and chief sales scientist of Cerebral Selling, David's unique science and empathy-based approaches to drive revenue and talent growth have been published in the Harvard Business Review, as well as in Forbes, Entrepreneur, and Inc. magazines. Often referred to as a sales professor, David is also the author of the best-selling book, Sell the Way You Buy, and an adjunct professor at the Smith School of Business at Queen's University. When he's not thinking about sales, which I think is rarely, David loves to cook, write, and spend quality family time with his wife and three daughters. Please help me welcome David. Hey, David, good morning out there. How are you? <laughs> good evening to you too. Yeah. yeah thank you. Uh, so let's let's get started if you're ready. Uh, I, I, I'm really, really uh, curious to understand the science of sales because uh, what you've written about in your book is uh, sell the way you buy. And it's a huge point that a lot of salespeople like us miss. Most of the people watching this are entrepreneurs. And um, it can be a big entrepreneur. It can be a startup, you know, just started off. Can you talk about, uh, you know, like what is the science behind that you start about in the book? And we can probably go deeper into it. Yeah, I know for sure. Well, look, so here's the thing, you know, everyone gets into sales by accident, right? You know, like we, no one grows up and says, you know what I want to be when I grow up is that I want to be in sales. And and we love sales and we love selling, but most people don't like talking to salespeople, right? Even salespeople, if I were to ask you, if you're listening out there, ask yourself, do you like talking to salespeople? Like most people would say no, right? And so sell the way you buy is kind of, you know, there's a, there's two components of sell the way you buy. Number one, there's an empathetic component, which is, you know, don't use sales tactics that wouldn't work on you if you found yourself on the buyer side of the equation. And, and that's, you know, where we have this very visceral negative reaction to salespeople. It's because they do things that make us feel uncomfortable. And yet we still go out and we do very similar things to our customers. That's the first thing. But the second thing around sell the way you buy is really understanding the pathways and mechanisms by which human beings make I'd say purchasing decisions, but decisions in general. And if you mm. understand those pathways, then you can sell to people along the, the kind of the, the, the core emotional buying pathways. Unfortunately, most of us don't understand how we buy or make decisions. In fact, you know, it's part of human nature is just to, you know, to, to make decisions based on emotion, not think too much about it because the purpose of our brain is to keep us safe and not use any energy. So sell the way you buy. There's an empathetic component and a scientific component. And I, it's the science that I love, I love diving into because it's so hidden. Great. So why don't we start with science? Uh, uh, very few people talk about the science. I think the way you will talk about it. Uh, can, can you give us some insights into that? What is the science behind sales? Yeah, well, the, 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 the big take home message and the science behind sales is that it's all very hidden and it's all very emotional. So think about this in your life, right? Think about something that you spend money on that another person would look at and say, that's ridiculous. I don't understand why she's just spending money on this thing, right? Like we, sometimes it's, it's clothes or, you know, uh, uh, travel or wine or a hobby, music. It can be all, you know, the, the arts. 
And it can be all these things. And the, the questions are like, why are you investing in these things? Right. So that's kind of like the first thing is like, it's, there's a very, we have very emotional connections to the things we spend money on, but even simple things, like, for example, let's say you had a hard day at work. Okay. And you, you know, you had all these clients and meetings and all these things going on, or you lost the deal, you wanted it, whatever it was. And at the end of the day, you come home and you say, you know what I deserve? It's been a hard day. You know what I deserve? Ashish, what do you deserve? A bill, man. <laughs> <laughs> but so this is the thing, right? And now if you're listening to this, and you know, hope maybe you're listening to this at the end of your long day, right? I want you to ask yourself at the end of the day, like, what do you deserve? And people say beer, pizza, like so they say things that let's agree are not good for you. Like they're not, you know, if you were your doctor making this decision, you would say, this is not good for you to have a beer. You should have a glass of water, maybe a salad, do some yoga, and then you'll be good, right? So we make these decisions that are actually not in our best interest, but we do them because they make us feel good. And I would submit to you that the same thing happens in selling, right? And buying, right? We all buy things and invest in things, whether it's people, insurance, hobbies, software, whatever it is that we find valuable emotionally, right? Emotional value. But, you know, the funny thing is emotional value doesn't often equate to ROI or business value, mm. right? And, so, and we trick ourselves into thinking that everything has to have an ROI. Everything has to have a business value. And yet you do things, you buy things that don't necessarily have a ROI, a return on investment, but you do them because you have this, you know, this emotional reaction to them. And so we can leverage those same powers in the world of even B2B you know, technology selling, whatever it is you're selling. But that's the idea is that, you know, emotions play such a huge role in how we make everyday decisions. And that that includes any uh, purchasing decision as well. And is there any reason why emotions play such an important role? Is there any science behind that? Well, the science is, you know, it all comes down to our brain, right? The purpose of our brain is to keep us safe and use as few calories as possible. And so when we start thinking about, okay, should I invest, let's say like, should I invest in, um, you know, this, uh, this B2B technology, the question, let's say, for example, I'm in the mood, I'm in the market for IT security software and for what I need, just need to increase the security of my, uh, my network. So why is that, right? What's the ROI? Like, what's the benefit? Maybe I'm in the market for that kind of technology because I had a data breach at my company. And now I need to make sure that data breach doesn't happen again because it's eroding the trust in my business. And also maybe I'm the IT manager and I'm going to lose my job, you know, mm. again, if this happens, right? And so these are all very emotional reasons. When I go out and now I'm trying to pick a vendor to supply me with a solution, what do I care about? Like, what is it that I value? Do I value the cheapest price or do I value the vendor that's going to keep me safe, right? The one that's going to protect me and my company and my reputation and my job. And how much am I willing to pay you know, mm. for that? Even now, I'll give you like an example. So let's assume like this was a year ago. I know we, we would all wish it was, you know, a year ago. <laughs> yeah. Let's say we're a year ago and you are buying personal protective equipment, PPE. Let's say you work for a hospital, you're buying PPE, right? Now, a year ago, let's say 14 months ago, what would you care about? You would probably care about you know, um, uh, price is important. And, you know, the quality, it has to be good enough. It doesn't have to be the best, just, you know, price, quality, you know, quality can be good enough. Now, fast forward, okay? Now you're in the middle of the pandemic where you can't get PPE, like it's very scarce. And the quality needs to be very high. What do you care about now, right? You probably don't care about the price as much, right? You probably care about, I need it yesterday. It needs to be super high quality, right? So the mm -hmm. things that you care about, change. And this is just an example of how when we go and we buy things in the market, our point of view, our mental state, our emotional state, the problem we're emotionally trying to solve for will absolutely dictate the way we, we make purchasing decisions. And so the idea is as salespeople, how can we recognize these things and sell to people along these emotional pathways? Wow. And that was my next question. When you said the last line, how do we recognize? So while we are prospecting, how do we say this in language, you know, and, and we are having those first introductory chats with our prospects. You can pick up any industry, you know, as an example, I think it will help all of us understand, you know, uh, that conversation to happen. We are prospecting. For sure. Well, there's a, there's a bunch of tactics. So I talk about these tactics in my book and on my website and blog and so on. But to give you an example, one of the tactics is very, very powerful is one that I refer to as assumptive priming. Okay. So I'll give, I give, I like to give 
personal examples from just life so people can understand and we'll relate them back to sales. So let's say I go to the gym and I'm there at the gym and I, I'm there uh, there's a, and I'm there to see a personal trainer. And I'm there to see the personal trainer because I've been married to my wife for, for many years and we have a great relationship. But I, I'm starting to think that me, maybe after all these years, she doesn't find me desirable anymore. Hmm. This, is a fict- this is a fictitious story, by the way, for all of your listeners. Yeah. <laughs> so, so now I'm at the gym and I'm talking to the personal, and that's why I'm there. I'm talking to the personal trainer. And the trainer says to me, hey, you know, David, welcome to the gym. Um, you know, how can I help you? Do you think that I'm going to tell the trainer why I'm really there? No. Probably not, right? Because the same way, for example, if I had a data breach at my company and now I'm in the market for IT security software and then the, the, the you're the sales rep and, and you say, so David, what, what can I help you with IT security software? Like, I'm probably not going to tell you that I had a data breach and that my, I'm going to lose my job if I don't fix this, right? So one of the, the, the best tactics to get people to open up in the science of self-disclosure is a tactic I refer to as assumptive priming, which is to basically... Uh, Think about all of the problems that your customer is likely experiencing based on their role, the size of their company, the market they're in. Like this needs to be a very like educated approach that you take. And then when you speak to them, try to include some of these, uh, some of these uh, assumptions about some of the problems they might be experiencing and offer to them as a bit of a menu in your introduction. Now, so for example, if I was in the gym, and I was a personal trainer, I could say, you know, hey, look, Ashish, welcome to the gym. Hey, look, you know, you know, I'm curious, why are you here? And how can I help you? You know, the reason I ask is because typically when I see, you know, guys like, like you, like me in the gym, look, sometimes they're trying to get in shape to run a triathlon or a big, you know, marathon or big event. Sometimes they're trying to get in shape for their, you know, their significant other, or look, sometimes they went to the doctor and the doctor said, you know, hey, Sheesh, if you don't get on a treadmill in the next, you know, <laughs> n- next little while, you're going to have a heart attack. Now, look, I don't know why you're here, Sheesh, but, you know, you tell me. Now, I'm giving that just as an example. After I've listed some of the reasons why a person like you might be interested in training, now all of a sudden you're going to think, oh my gosh, you know what? The he, he said the reason why I'm here. It's actually, maybe... Maybe he sees people like me all the time. Maybe this thing that I thought was embarrassing or weird isn't actually embarrassing or weird. And so as salespeople, we can do the same thing. And and in fact, unfortunately, you see bad examples of this most often, right? You know, poor prospecting that happens over LinkedIn, for example, where someone reaches out and says, you know, hey, Ashish, as the CEO of Motivational Diaries, you probably care about, you know, blah, 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 blah. And if it's not focused, if it's not targeted, it just feels like a drive-by pitch. And we are very resistant to the drive-by pitch. However, if you do a little bit of homework, if you know a little bit about your customer, for example, I have uh, one of my clients provides uh, cloud-based uh, bookkeeping services. Mm. And when they speak to, a, when they do, when they prospect, they speak to a customer, in the, they know in their industry that people are doing one of three things. They're, they're doing spreadsheets, they're using like QuickBooks, which is like the big you know, player in the space, or they're doing nothing. And so as soon as they know which one of those things that they're doing, they can start launching into a bit of an assumptive priming conversation. Hey, look, so since you're using QuickBooks, you know, I work with clients all the time who tell me that you know, they like QuickBooks, but they hate A, B, and C, or that they struggle with A, B, and C. And, and now I'm reaching into your head and I'm pulling out like your fears and your thoughts and your experiences, and I'm showing it to you. And it demonstrates that I'm someone who can help. And so again, my advice, th- there's lots of different tactics we can use. And in fact, even in the little narrative I've, I've just given you, I've incorporated a whole bunch of different tactics that I, mm. I teach in my programs, but that assumptive priming, like really knowing your customer and showcasing the fact that you know them in your outreach and maybe picking on something that is what I refer to as the unknown, unspoken, like a problem that the customer has that they kind of, they kind of might know or might not know, but it's lingering in the back of their head and you bring it to the forefront. Mm. That's very powerful. It shows the other person that you are someone who can help them. And this is important, not just for salespeople in general, but especially, especially young salespeople, young or newer salespeople who are calling on more senior level decision makers whose job you've never done. Mm. Mm. Wow. You know, I always wonder, uh, David, when we get so many text message communications, when we get so many emails, when we get so many WhatsApps, uh, 
And then what happens is, I'm talking about us as the community of entrepreneurs, right? I start feeling left out for my product that, oh, everybody's doing it. So I should also send that WhatsApp communication. Okay? But what you just said is a little different if you think about it. It's not the quantity really, it's the outcome. And the outcome is focused on quality. And if you focus on that, which which does not really mean that you compromise on the quantity, uh, if it's a, if it's possible for you, but if you focus on the quality of that, you know you will get the outcomes, and those outcomes would be more in relation to what will help you close that deal faster, uh, and that's what you're saying, right? So, so it's just from your experience, when you see people, you know, just doing a mass marketing uh, campaign. Uh, and because others are doing it, what do you tell them, you know, along these lines that will help them change their strategy? Because a lot of people spend money on that. For sure. Well, look, I'm a big fan of like the segmentation approach. So when I, I used to work at Salesforce, so I'm, I'm very much like many of you out there listening. So I'm a, I was an entrepreneur. I did four uh, B2B technology startups. They were all VC funded. Three ended, ended up getting acquired. And one that I helped start in 2008 was acquired by Salesforce. So I came over to Salesforce. I spent five really great years kind of seeing how the sales machines were built, you know, operationally and culturally at scale. And I ended up running small business sales for the Eastern US. So I had lots of sales reps across many cities. And each of those sales reps had, you know, probably between three or 400 accounts that they could call into. And like, that's a lot of accounts. Like it's way more than you could possibly prospect. So one of the things that we did was we did this segmentation and prioritization exercise. So we said, look, you have all of these people, let's say in email marketing, you could blast out a message to all these people. Now, you know that not all those people are gonna buy things and not all those people are equally good prospects for you. You know, some might be ranked higher based on their role or their industry or their need or so on. And so what we would do is we do this tiering exercise where we would say, okay, for, you know, for out of the 400, you know, customers, 20 of them are going to be very high profile, you know, targets for us because they're right in our sweet spot. They're right in the right geography. And we're going to put more effort into those accounts, right? So we're going to do a little bit more research, do a little bit more personalization in the outreach, a little bit more white glove treatment. But then we're going to have like other, you know, kind of the, the tier two, tier three, like the bigger groups. And when people think about like email marketing, they often think about like just, just like one big group. And so the idea is like to the extent that you can personalize that marketing a little bit. Now, look, I'm not saying you can always take your tier, like if you have your tier one accounts and you can treat them like in like a very special manner with like the right kind of outreach and messages um, and, and high degree personalization, do that. But even in that kind of, you know, that big middle category, you can segment like your messages, even when you're doing an email blast, based on their role. Like you, know, you can find out their role very easily, you just you know, on LinkedIn or there's all these like data scraping tools and so on, data fortification, find out what their role, their geography, their industry, just changing a few little words. And I'm not saying you could blast it out to a thousand, you know, like let's say your list is a hundred thousand people. Mm. You can still segment that by geography, role, you know, uh, title, you know, all these things to just inject a little bit a personalization. So this idea of personalization at scale is not a pipe dream. Like you, you can do it. So I would implore you if you're if you're thinking about prospecting, you're using outreach tactics, don't get it wrong. But you can start refining from a, a good generic message to a like a very specific, repeatable, high volume message just by doing a little bit of research into like titles, geography, role, responsibility, you know, problems that that industry is facing, make it as relevant as you can at scale. And it still can be very, very powerful as far as prospecting. Wow. David, you, you, what you said just right now, it changed what's going to happen on my LinkedIn from tomorrow. <laughs> and, and I'm being honest, I'll, I'll tell you what we've been doing for the last two and a half years. Uh, 20 to 25 percent of our revenues come from LinkedIn, which is not bad because, you know, we do cold calls and then there's reference the, the usual stuff. Uh, but the messages that we send uh, are 60 messages every single day, uh, which are in between what you just said. And when I'm, I'm thinking now like a buyer, I'm like, that's that's pretty generic. So it's going something like, you know, uh, you know, pa pandemic is, is, is kind of taking a toll on a lot of us. I hope you're doing well. Uh, I just wanted to say a hi uh, because we are connected on LinkedIn. This is what we do. So I think it's not bad, but it's not really good. 
because it's generic it's not talking about that person it's just you know talking in between uh and i think if i change that given what you are saying right now uh the science of productivity is going to first hit me because my team's going to think oh, i'm only sending 10 messages today versus 60 uh and it feels like that's all i did today but if you look at from the other perspective of quality and the results i think in the next 30 days we would have a much better outcome and it may even change our sales to you know probably 30% to 35% versus 25 which is it right now and i think that's what happens when you apply what you just said and i'm your first student who's going to apply this from today <laughs> tomorrow tomorrow it's night here yeah No, look, it's you know I get all these very poor quality outreaches, and so I wrote this article. It's on my it's on my my blog, Cerebral Selling, and it's called three. It says uh, it's it says um, do your homework. The article is called Do Your Homework: Three Reasons Why Personalizing Your Outreach You Know Drives Results. And one of the things that this is kind of like a hidden thing because what we're talking about here is that you want to personalize your outreach so someone converts and and buys your product or service. But I would submit to you that one of the biggest problems that we have, especially when we prospect, is that the people that we reach out to never get back to us. Like we'll never hear from them. Like if I'm not interested, I'm just going to completely ignore you. And then you're left wondering, like, well, what should I do? Should I follow up again with like another? You know, maybe you are interested. Maybe you were just busy. I don't know. And so we, you know, we 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 say in sales, like, no is the second best answer. You know, yes is the best answer. <laughs> no is the second best. And then maybe or disappearing or ghosting is the worst, right? And so one of the things when you personalize your outreach if I see that someone put in a little bit of effort mm. when they reached out to me like they looked at something a little bit deeper on my profile or if they said you know hey David I caught your book and I really enjoyed this chapter or like things you can do for free like you can get like a you know free preview of my book on Amazon you can read my articles or videos on YouTube or whatever and you reach out to me and say hey David I really enjoyed this one thing or whatever it was it shows me that you did like a little bit of research. This wasn't like a drive by. You didn't, you know, you didn't pick me randomly. You picked me specifically and you did maybe even if it's 30 seconds of research. Now the beauty of even doing a little bit of research is that it creates this power of reciprocity, invokes this power of reciprocity. And that this is again mm. in the signs of selling. When I do something nice for someone, it makes them more likely that they're going to do something nice for me in return. And we see this all the time. In fact, you know, you see this in um in in restaurants and you know a server staff who you know they do these little experiments where like at the you know at the end of a of a meal the server leaves you like a mint or like a little treat you know on your uh, when they give you your bill and they did this experiment where they found that uh, servers who leave one mint you know like a little mint with the bill they see a 3% you know increase in tips if they had two mints in with the bill the, in, the increase in tips was 14% Now this is the this is the kicker because I want to <laughs> I want to impress this idea of reciprocity. You think oh well well what's the next one is it 3 mints? Like, no, it's not 3 mints. What they do is they give one mint and then they walk away and then they come back and they they give you another one. They say this this is just for you, right? It makes you feel special. So the 1 plus 1 21% increase in tips. So wow. when we do things, and there's lots of experiments like that, and I actually talk about them in my book. But there's lots of little things we do, little things for people, make them feel a little bit special. It's more likely they will get back to us. So again, let's get back to prospecting. When I do just a little bit of research on you, and I reach out, it shows you that I've invested the time, and then it makes you more likely not to necessarily convert and buy my product, but at least you'll get back to me and tell me no. right or you know or hopefully yes or give me some context right but putting in that little bit of effort will absolutely increase your response rates which is when we prospect like we just want people to respond half the time you know we love mm. to convert but even just to start a conversation so a little bit of effort will go a long way yeah and and when you look at the long term value of that conversation some way or the other you would get the benefit out of it you know may, maybe this one's not going to buy from you but because they remember you they might refer you and that happens when you put in the effort or a right, good stuff so couple more questions i want to speak about empathy now if we may uh, can you speak about that part of the of the book uh, you know wh- wh- why is that there yeah you know like empathy is so important because you know again if we use tactics on people that wouldn't work on us then why would we ever expect these customers to convert and i'll tell you like as a vp of sales i had this all the time my reps would come to me and they would say you know hey david you know i'm trying to get in touch with ashish he's this great prospect he's gone dark 
And so I, I want to I want to send him this email and I want to I'm hoping he can get back to me. Will you read the email for me? And I would read the email and they would say, let me know what you think. And I would read the email and I would say, if you read this, would you get back to you? Right. And they're like, no. I'm like, well, then why are we sending this? Right. And so that's part of the challenge is that, you know, in sales, we often go out and we execute tactics that wouldn't work on us. And now the, the bigger question is not is not, not what are these tactics? Because we can name all sorts of, you know, outreach tactics and closing tactics and, you know, hey, is there any reason why she, she wouldn't want to buy from me today? Like there's all these tactics that we know wouldn't work on us. And the question is not what are the tactics, but why do we use these tactics? Like if they wouldn't work on us, you know, why do we use them? So that's the thing I would put out to you is if you are executing a tactic in your sales motion, ask yourself, if you were on the buying side, but this thing that you're going to do, would it work on you? Right. And if, and, and if it wouldn't, then you shouldn't be doing it. But also this idea of like of empathy is, uh, uh, is really important because, uh, you know, again, we all buy emotionally. And when we do things that, that, that piss people off or rub them the wrong way, they're not going to be, they're not going to have any affinity to our product or service. So that's, that's kind of the, the trick is just really understanding like why these tactics wouldn't work on you in the first place. You know, and, and breaking the cycle, because I'll tell you, like, one of the reasons why the question is, well, why do we do these things if they don't work is because that's what we were taught. Like, if there's no good reason, right? Our, our manager, our sensei, our, our master, they were the ones that taught us how to do this. They told us how to do this. There's no school. There's no, it's not like medicine or accounting where you have to go and be certified. Anyone can be in sales, right? Mm. So if you just learn from the person that taught you or what you saw on the internet, without really asking yourself, like, should I even be doing this? Like, does this work? You know, is this, is this scientifically proven to work? Is there like a reason why? Or is this just someone saying, oh, this is what I did. This is what you should do, right? And so empathy is important in terms of helping break that cycle. Wow. And do you think it also happens because salespeople have this thing in their mind that they have to be in a rush? So whether it's emails or on calls, uh, it's just the thing, right? Like they feel that they have to be in the rush. So they feel like salespeople. Uh, but if you slow down and do what you're saying, which is what you think about, you feel before you write or before you talk, you don't have to really work that hard. Do you think that's also a reason, that feeling in the air? Look, sales is a tough job. <laughs> sales is a tough job. <laughs> like, but, but it's like the property guys, you know, the real estate guys. Uh, you know, if you take that example, if the boss comes to know <laughs> the guy made only 10 calls at the end of the day, it's a little scary for the first 30 days. It's true. There's definitely like a source of urgency that we have in sales that propels us. Unfortunately, that sense of urgency, especially let's say it's the end of our quota period and we haven't hit our number. And then we start acting with like, you know, an unsustainable level of effort and just calling everyone we can. And some of these things are good. The hustle is good. I'll tell you, you know, one of the things that um, I'm often asked is about, you know, sales, like call quotas, like, should we have 50 calls a day, hundred calls a day, 20, like, is that bad? Or if you, if you tell me, like you say, you come to me, you say, David, I can hit my number. I'm going to make 10 calls a day, but they're going to be really high quality calls. Right. I really want to believe you that you're gonna be able to do that, right? And certainly an experienced seller can probably do that, right? But the problem is, and this is something I, I saw again at Salesforce, and the beauty of Salesforce is that you have so much data, you have, you, have, you have thousands of reps, tens of thousands of calls. And what I saw was that there was a correlation between the number of calls and contact, you know, outreach, you know, outreach requests that reps did and quota attainment, right? And so you might tell me, hey, look, you know, I can work smart. I want to make 10 calls a day, not 50. And I want to believe you. And I, I believe if you do it, you can achieve that result. But for most sellers, there needs to be a certain amount of cadence and hustle <laughs> and outreach that because, because I have no better prescription for you, right? Because at every outreach attempt, we're learning, we're iterating, right? We're kind of expanding our sphere. So I would say don't don't fall back and become complacent and be like, okay, I'm only going to reach out to five people a day, but they're going to be the best outreaches I've ever seen in my life, right? Like there needs to be a certain amount of, of cadence and hustle. And this is where striking that balance. That's why, by the way, that's why we pay good salespeople a lot of money to do this job and not high school students, you know, minimum wage to, to sell. Selling, and I go back to my, one of my, my big sales heroes, Dan Pink, in his book, To Sell as Human. And, you know, he talks about, you know, sales is a thinking person's profession. It's like 
reading an MRI scan. It's like designing a house, performing intricate surgery. So this balance of like volume, right? That we, and, and, and quota attainment and, and, you know, and, and revenue and so on that we get into in these, you know, time crunches, as well as quality and finesse and not imparting a sense of pressure. Because when you, for example, when you talk to a sales rep at the end of their quota period, you can feel, right? If they haven't hit their quota, <laughs> like just by like, and this is actually a very important point. Like the feeling that we get from the people that sell to us. And I, so when my kids come to me, right? And it, if you if you ever you know work with kids, you have nieces, nephews, whatever it is, if you have kids that come to you and they're about to hit you up for something, right? My kids, they come to me and they want a lift to the mall or they want to you know download an app or they want a snack before dinner. I can tell immediately just by the way they approach me, right? So they'll say like, dad, and I'll be like, the answer is no. You know, I get immediately defensive. So people can tell if you're about to be pitched. They can, they can tell if you're going to pitch them. People can tell if you believe in what you're selling and what you're saying. You know, hopefully if you're listening to this, can you tell Ashish that I love what I do? I was just going to ask you that as my last <laughs> question. Where do you get all this drive from? Believe me or not, that was going to be my last question. How do you get so much passion? Well, it's the morning my time. I know it's the evening for your time. So, <laughs> But so I'm, I'm sure... The- I'm sure you would still be about this peak if we were doing it at a different time. <laughs> well, it's funny, you know, the question of like, well, how do you know this is what you're supposed to be doing? It's like, you know, when I do things like this, when I talk about sales, like time stands still for me. Like, I just love it so much because I was an engineer. I was a research scientist before I got into sales 20 years ago. And so I love figuring out how things work, right? And so sales to me is like that. It's so complicated and wonderful and, you know, and and it's so important to everyone, Right. And so I say, look, you can tell that I love what I do. I love what I do a lot. I'm glad you can tell. But when you come to me and you're going to sell me something, I can tell if you believe in what you're saying or not. I can believe if you, you know, if you, if you honestly have done your research, if you feel that your solution is going to have a big impact on my life, like I can tell. And it's very hard to fit. So again, back to this idea of empathy, people can tell if you don't believe in what you're saying. They don't believe, they can tell if you don't believe in what you're selling. And so you have to find that like deep rooted emotional belief so that you can impart that excitement and enthusiasm to them because we all get these low value drive by sales pitches where you can tell people do not believe in what they're selling. They're reading from a script. It sounds unnatural. It sounds forced and it's a massive turnoff. Wow. If you are listening to this, listen to the last three to four minutes again. It's so important. And especially if you're experienced, you can relate to what he's saying because somewhere along the line, you and I, we miss that passion. And you know, those patches can become long. And when you listen to this, it will do something and it will take you back to your youth, especially if you've got that experience. Uh, so David, I want to I wanna ask you this one last thing. You know, of course, where do people find you? Where do people connect with you? And, uh, you know, uh, I think his book is there in India, guys. So you can get it on Amazon or Flipkart. Uh, but yeah, you can get the book, uh, Sell the Way You Buy. And uh, it's David Primer. Exactly, yeah. right? Yeah. And uh, I, I want to ask you this last question, though. Your final thought for the world that we are in right now. Uh, how do we look at sales now as entrepreneurs? Well, it's interesting. Like, I, uh, I kind of go back, you know, I wrote this article Uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, and the, the title was How to Sell During Times of Adversity. So by all means, go check that out on my blog. And one of the things I mentioned was I said, you know, people, have, there's a process of natural selection that's almost happening now. Meaning, you know, when people are in a tough spot, you know, people have lost their jobs. There are so many distractions. We're all working from home and, and all these things are happening. Uh, it's almost like uh, our minds are hitting record. You know, we're remembering, like when you think about your most vivid memories, Oftentimes, they're the, the memories where things went uh, amazingly well and horrifically bad. You always remember like the very high intensity emotional moments. And so right now, we've been in this high intensity emotional moment for a year. And I say in sales, people will remember how you treat them during periods of adversity. They'll remember it more than the other times. And so I say there's a bit of a, a process of natural selection going on now. In fact, 2020 was the best year for my business because of this process of natural selection. People were realizing that, hey, you know what? 
we need to really pay attention to how we treat people during the pandemic, during times of adversity, because they are going to remember. And humans will have a much lower tolerance for poor behavior, these poor drive-by pitches, these poor you know, sales you know, uh, execution. When they are down, they will hate it even more and they will, it will even further damage your, your personal brand, your company brand. And it's funny, you know, I don't know if you, you saw this, at the beginning of the pandemic, we had a whole bunch of like TV commercials and advertisements and so on. And they were filmed before the pandemic. And so you're watching this and you're thinking, do they even know what's going on here, right? And then, <laughs> and then they all transition. They all transition to like pandemic commercials. It was, you know, the soft piano music. We're all in this together, all these things. And then that only lasted like a month or so. And then they moved on to something else. And so the, the evolution, the, the psyche of, of people in the world is evolving so quickly now but you need to make sure that you are attuning yourself very much to the mindset of your customers, especially in the past year, because things are moving faster than they have ever been. And there's this process of natural selection where people will have a much lower tolerance for poor messaging, poor sales ta tactics, poor execution. So my advice to, to everyone now is there's never been a more important time for empathy. There's never been a more important time to really look at your tactics and make sure that they are creating the, the proper and desired emotional response in the mind of your customer. Because if it doesn't, they will remember, especially now. Wow. Where do people find you? What's the best way to get in touch? Well, the, the good thing is I give away lots of stuff for free on my website, which is cerebralselling, all one word, dot com. So cerebralselling.com. Um, I also have a YouTube channel by the same name, which you can find on YouTube. Um, as well as, and then the book, Sell the Way You Buy. Um, Sell the Way You Buy, the book is the only thing, unfortunately, I have no control over, I have to charge for, but everything else, the, the blogs, the YouTube channel, it's all free. So by all means, go check them out. And uh, there's there's lots of great insights there. Amazing. Well, well, Dave, it's, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Your, your energy is amazing. Your insights are amazing. Uh, you got to look at these things again and again if you're going to apply them properly. It's not about how fast you go through the interview, but it's it's how deep you go into it. And that's what I feel about the chat that we've had today. It means a lot. You've given me something to look at from tomorrow. And I'm thinking about my LinkedIn messages and I appreciate that. So thanks a lot. Oh, no, look, my pleasure. And this, this is a process of learning. We're all learning. Like we're all students. We're all figuring it out. The world is changing so fast of buying, selling people. Uh, you know, so commit yourself to just learning and being a student, right? And you'll you'll always, be, you know, committing yourself to learning, especially in this profession, will always lead you on the path to success. So yeah. thank you so much for having me. It was great to connect yeah, with you. Yeah, it's great. Thanks so much, Ashish. All right, thank you. All right, have a, great have a good night. Take care, Ed. Bye.